While Romero might be the king of zombies, you can't have a discussion about the undead without saying one specific F-word. Fulci. While some of his other films would feature ghouls and monsters that could be thrown into the zombie category by technicality, his biggest addition to the subgenre would come in 1979 with the film Zombie. International audiences were loving the flesh-chomping films of George Romero, but Fulci would come along and deliver a film full of dark brutality that would leave audiences in shock. Instead of comic scenes of zombies riding the escalator or stumbling down an ice ring in Dawn of the Dead, filmgoers were treated to The Walking Dead tearing through walls and ripping flesh from unsuspecting victims. The violence made the audiences squirm in their seats as eyes were gouged out and flesh was torn from bone, and they loved every minute of it. So let's break it down with the film Zombie here on Best Foreign Horror. In the film Zombie, we open with a boat floating into New York Harbor. The Coast Guard shows up thinking they've got a pretty decent bonus for bringing in an abandoned boat. After they board the boat, they find the only passenger is a member of the Walking Dead. The undead occupant attacks one of the guards, ripping his throat out. When it makes its way up to the top deck, the other guard opens fire on it. The ghoul falls in the river, never to be seen again. The large guy that played the zombie even went to a local punk bar in his full zombie makeup with blood splattered all over him. No one even thought it was weird and just walked right by him. In a busy news building, journalist Peter West is tasked with checking out the story of this abandoned boat. This scene was filmed in an actual news building, and they even interrupted a meeting by Rupert Murdoch. He was obviously not pleased. As West is investigating, he runs into Anne Bowles, the daughter of the man who owns the boat, and she mentions that her father is down in the Caribbean working on a strange illness that is sweeping the area. Together they hire a boat and make their way down to the island. Their hosts are Brian and Susan, who take them to the tropics in search of Anne's father. We are then introduced to Dr. David Menard, who is studying the sudden phenomenon of the undead rising from the grave. His wife is at home alone when she is attacked by a zombie horde. The scene is tense as the zombies try to get into the house. One finally does and explodes through the wall, bringing a horrific death to Menard's wife. After West and Bowles finally reach the island, they meet up with Dr. Menard, who sends them to collect his wife. Instead, what they find is the place overrun with zombies, feasting on the body of his recently killed wife. They jump into the jeep and head back to the hospital to inform Menard that his wife is dead. However, they end up wrecking their jeep, and one of the group ends up with an ankle injury. The group tries to travel by foot the rest of the way, but has to stop in a clearing. Suddenly, they realize the clearing is actually a graveyard from the old conquistador days of the island. When the dead begin to escape their graves, they fight as best they can to make a break for the hospital. There, they hope to get the doctor and get off the island in their boat. As expected, though, the undead have completely taken over the island and descend upon the hospital. They do their best to fight their way out, but one of the group is bitten. The hospital is set on fire, and the group escapes to their boat to head back to New York City with the news of this undead outbreak. As they enter the harbor with their now undead boatmates as evidence, they hear an emergency announcement on the radio that zombies have flooded the city. They are too late and the zombie apocalypse is here. The final fantastic scene has zombies slowly crossing the bridge into downtown New York. However, you can see the traffic freely moving back and forth. People do still have jobs at the end of the world, after all. One thing fans will notice about this film is the look of the zombies. While the look of the zombies in the Romero movies was fine, here we see the corpses that have been left out in the sun for a long time before they finally rise. Each one has dirt just caked on it. The skin looks like it has dried out and begun to flake off in large chunks, giving the zombies a dried out look, which is really unnerving. Even the more recent undead will end up with maggots, or just a mushy look, that really makes them stand out apart from anything that we've seen before. These zombies were modeled after the more traditional voodoo zombies that had been seen before Night of the Living Dead took the zombie mythos to its modern direction. It's mentioned that Dr. Menard thinks the dead are returning due to a voodoo curse. A majority of the zombies in this film walk around with their heads down and eyes closed with their arms at their sides. If Romero gave birth to the modern zombie, then Fulci helped build a bridge from there to the traditional zombies that we had seen before and made them all the more terrifying. One of the scenes this movie's definitely known for is the shark vs. zombie fight. Underwater. It's amazing. While West and Bowles are on their way to the island with the crew of the boat, one of them decides to go down and look around with some scuba gear. She's rattled by the appearance of a tiger shark and bumps into the body of a man. The body seems to have been there for a while as it's already sort of decomposed. It looks past her as she swims away and instead focuses on the shark. It then attacks the creature and the shark fights back. The zombie's able to grab chunks off the shark and shove them into its mouth, but we also see the shark grab onto the arm and chew on it while the fight continues. What ensues is cinematic history. Since it was 1979, the only real way to get the shot is to send the guy dressed as a zombie into the water and have a showdown with a real tiger shark. The crazy thing is the guy that was supposed to play the zombie got sick the day of the shoot. Something tells me it was more than an upset stomach that got to him that day. The shark's trainer instead had to get dressed up to play the zombie. 
Before the shoot, the trainer made sure to feed the shark so it wouldn't think he was a nice snack. It also helped that they shot it up with some sedatives before the camera rolled. Some reports say that this was filmed without Fulci's knowledge, and that Ugo Tucci devised it. Either way, it works wonderfully on film. While the shark vs. zombie fight might be the most remembered scene from this movie, the eye gouging scene is for sure the most memorable effect. If you look at the rest of Fulci's catalog, he definitely has a thing for eye trauma. Here we see Dr. Menard's wife trying to stave off a zombie infiltration into the house. As she pushes furniture up against the doors and entry points, hands finally burst through the wall. This leaves a piece of jagged wood sticking up. The hands grab the back of her head and begin to draw her forward. The slow pull of the scene makes it even worse. As a viewer, you just know it's coming, and they do a close-up of the piece of wood and then cut to a close-up of her wide eye. They keep moving back and forth between the two, and then a medium shot to show you how far the distance is closing in. She is screaming the whole time, knowing what is about to happen. Then it finally does. The wood goes right into her eyeball and makes the viewer repel at the ooze that leaves her now destroyed socket. But at least the trauma's over, right? No. Then she slides to the side and the giant splinter of wood breaks off, leaving the wooden stake pointing out of her eye socket. It's almost as traumatizing for the audience as it is for the victim. And if you're watching this movie because you're a big zombie fan, and why else would you be, then the Conquistador Graveyard brings you lots of zombie goodness. As our heroes lay on the ground trying to regain some strength before they finish up their journey to the hospital, long dead bodies begin to set up out of their graves. As they get up, we see the age on the face and the bodies of these zombies who've been laying in the sun-beaten earth for the past century. The dirt is caked into their bodies and the skin is dry, flaking off as they begin to attack on the group. Seeing them rise from the very ground the characters are just laying on makes you wonder what exactly is waiting under your feet at any time you walk into the dirt path. You never know. The film is cast perfectly, with Tisa Farrow as Anne Bowles. You believe her fear as she leaves New York to find out what happened to her father. The disparity between the big city to the rural locations on the island shows just how out of her comfort zone she is. She has no idea what she is getting into, and the lost nature of her character is definitely present. Ian McCullough was cast due to his TV show Survivors, which was a huge hit in Italy. His take on Peter West as someone who has to seek out the truth no matter how far away from home it takes him anchors the film. He wants to know what is happening, and after he finds out, he really hopes to let the world know before it gets out of hand. Little does he know, it's already too late. Al Cliver and Aretta Gay play the couple that transport West and Anne on their trip. As Brian and Susan, they get pulled into a world they didn't expect. Gray is the scuba diver that leads the zombie into the shark fight, and the film shows you their loving relationship throughout the whole story. When Susan is killed in the epic graveyard scene, Brian becomes a broken man. When we get to the hospital scene and Brian is confronted with Susan shambling towards him, he finds he can't go through with dispatching her. He seems mesmerized that his partner is standing right in front of him until it's too late, and Susan takes a big old chunk out of his neck. Brian has pulled to safety, but it's already too late. Fulci had worked a wide array of genres before he did zombie. His giallo output with a lizard and a woman's skin and don't torture a duckling had garnered a lot of attention, and after Zombie, his Gates of Hell trilogy gained him even more horror praise. One of the things he was not happy about, though, was Zombie being marketed as a sequel to Dawn of the Dead. He made the movie under the title Nightmare Island, but the producers decided to tie it to the Romero movie, which had come out as Zombie in the Italian market. While Fulci was upset that in Italy it became Zombie 2, he was happy that in the US it was just released as Zombie. The film ended up being quite popular in Italy, but once it hit the English-speaking markets, they began to run into problems. The British Board of Film Classification required it to edit out 1 minute and 46 seconds just to achieve an X rating. It would end up being on the dreaded Video Nasty list, and thus banned in the UK. While this was not good for any home rental release at the time, later it would be used in publicity for the home video release. Nothing helped sell titles like censorship. Eventually, as those laws had receded, it has been released uncensored in the UK, and garnered another critical review from the film community. They saw the merit in the film, and what the filmmaker had been intending to do with the film at the time, leading to an even bigger following in the region. Much later down the road, he even started work on Zombie 3 before he had to leave the project. Why he left is up for debate. Some reports say that his health had declined, others say he had a falling out with producers. In any case, he turned the directing duties over to Bruno Mattei and Claudio Fragasso to finish the last quarter of the film. While most American horror fans know about the Romero zombie films, they should absolutely go out of their way to find the Italian series of zombie films as well, even if it's just for Fulci's entry. The film helped push the subgenre further ahead by way of effects and great action sequences, while also reaching back to the zombie's voodoo roots to help bridge the past with the present. While the series never quite reached the heights of this film, it helped set up the Italian horror scene as a player in the zombie genre. It would push other filmmakers outside of the zombie genre to up their game. Even Fulci himself would return with even wilder films like City of the Living Dead and The Beyond to build on what he'd made here. 
While Fulci wasn't the only horror filmmaker in Italy at the time leaving his mark on the genre, he did leave a lasting impression that carries on even to this day. When you find someone who's never seen the film, all you have to do is mention that a zombie fights a shark and they're instantly intrigued. While the zombie genre has exploded since then, most people turn back to the Romero films to give acknowledgement to the past. But don't forget that Fulci helped foster that genre as well. As we see at the end of the film, the dead have arrived and we can't escape them. Thanks, Fulci. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate your support. If you have any suggestions for future episodes, please let us know in the comments.